So here's the challenge. Build one table out of one board in one day. Welcome to Worth the Effort Woodworking. My goal is by the end of the day, I can alleviate my woodworking embarrassment that I have actually been operating this CNC machine off of a bunch of plastic tubs. No table, no woodwork. I should be ashamed as a woodworker. And so that's what we're going to try and do today. Now, it is about 9 a.m. when I'm starting, and I'm already cheating a little bit because I went out yesterday, last night, and bought the lumber simply because we are about to get a rain, uh, a tropical storm coming through, and I didn't want to lug wood around in the back of the truck during the rain. Now, I went and bought one 2x12x16 by by foot board. I tried to get a 20 foot board, but I just didn't find any stock in there that I really liked. Uh, now, Whenever I buy lumber for shop projects and stuff like that, I always try and get lumber as close to the center of the tree as possible. If I can get the pith in the middle of the board, I will. And I would just assume that this middle section around the pith is waste wood, trash, throw it in the dumpster, whatever. But that would give me pristine quarter sawn lumber on the side. But because this is a challenge for me and I only had one board to build this entire table in, I didn't want to waste that center section. So I got in for this one wood slightly off the center of the pith so that I can use this center section. So in fact these two ends are what they call bastard grain where the grain is running at 45 degrees and the center section when I cut it off will be flat sawn. Uh, so the grain will be running across the board. It's the best I can do for this one challenge and Really, it's just a shop table, so it's not that big a deal. Now, I will say this. I was not happy with the stock I found out there. I only found two boards that were clear. Uh, this one had a few little pinhole knots, and, but the rest of it was pretty clear. The reason why I chose this board was up and down the entire length of the board, the grain was fairly straight. And when I turned the board on the side, I looked at the grain this way, and it wasn't that wavy. So my hope is, even though this is fairly green, I mean, it is still a little bit cool to the touch, uh, it shouldn't move that much. It's going to move. This is a shop appliance. I'm not too worried about it. Just I'm, We'll just deal with it. It's not that big a deal. Other than, otherwise, these boards, I notice that they are already cracking a little bit right down the middle. You get some internal stress cracking when they try and dry these things a little bit too quickly. So, because of that, uh, I'm going to be using these center sections for the legs because I'm going to be gluing two of them together and hopefully those cracks will be offset and they'll be all structural. Now, I'm walking into this project with no written design, no nothing like that. Now, I'll admit that I've been thinking about it and I have some general ideas in my head, but that's kind of the challenge to design as I go along and build something custom for this table. My rules to myself, yes, I start out with one board, a 2x12x16, by by I want to say it was a little under $24. Other than that, I'm allowing myself to use any tool and any scrap material I have in my shop. So, let's get busy. So here's my design thinking, because I'm invariably I'm going to be moving into a very small shop at the end of this month is I bought this little contractor table saw when I opened up the school. My first table saw ever, simply to help me speed up class preparations. Uh, and that's about all I use it for other than a stand for my sander, which is what it normally does. But it would be nice to have an outfeed table for this thing. And since my CNC is a nice flat surface and that cross beam is about four inches above the bed, and this thing doesn't cut much more, higher than that, that would make a nice little outfeed table for this. So I need to make the top of the CNC machine just a tad bit lower than the bed so that the wood can kind of fall off onto it, uh, which is going to dictate the height of the table uh, and how big I need to make my legs. And the legs are going to be the first thing I need to build because they are going to be glued together and I need to have enough time for those that glue to, set, glue to set. Uh, since a 2x12 is about an inch and a half thick, I figure by sandwiching two together I can get a nice 3 inch square and it will look nice and sturdy for me to uh, push around the shop. So the first thing I need to do is I need to cut out the center section of that 2x12 uh, because it had the cracks in it to sandwich together at enough uh, length so I can dimension it after the glue has dried to get me 
four legs for this site height. Okay, right about now, I kind of wish I'd gotten that 20-footer because doing the math in my head, that extra four feet would have made all the difference. But we're doing a Muhammad Ali here. We're floating like a butterfly, stinging like a bee. We're adapting as we go along. Hey, that's part of the challenge. Uh, what I'm going to have to do is glue up these two legs, which is what I had in the center section, and then I'm going to split them in half, and that'll be a two-by-three ratio instead of a one-by-one -one ratio. Also, to compensate for this mathematical screw up for a design I have in my head. I found four casters in somewhere around here. I don't know where they came from, but we got casters now, even cooler. What I'm about to do is cut these to length for what the legs are going to be, and then I'm going to joint opposite faces on either board. I'm not going to square them up. I'm not going to joint all four sides. I'm just going to make two faces flat that will glue together. And then as they sit for four to six hours, I will dimension up the leg after the fact. I'm trying to save time. Uh, I will say this, uh, because of how I selected the wood, I'm not getting too much internal stressing. As I was pushing through the bandsaw, a lot of times something yellow pine or bow or cup, these cut pretty much straight. The kirk was the same at the beginning at the ending. So I'm kind of happy about that. So let's get these legs glued up. One of my boards bowed a little bit, but I don't really care. Uh, whenever I glue it up, it will actually save me clamping because I can just clamp the two outsides and the interior will squeeze together. And I'll take care of it later. Uh-oh, I'm running low on glue. You might be using some screws later on in this project. And here's a tool tip. Your dog holes will help you get the last of the glue out of your glue bottles. So my legs are cooking right now. The CNC is actually 40 inches by 40 inches, but on either side there needs to be room for the little motor. So in case I accidentally bump into something, I don't want to bump into the CNC. So I need to make some stretchers for the table that are 44 inches for the front and back and 40 inches on the side uh, in length. And I think I'm going to wrap those on the outside of the legs and creating a notch in the legs. That's my design thinking right now. That way the stretcher's weight will sit on the legs and it won't be on screws uh, to hold screws or glues to hold it next to the leg. It'll all, all the gravity will be going down. So next up I'm going to dimension those and what you'll see me do is cut them to length and then I'm going to square the bottom and the side and then I'm going to run through, through, the, through the thickness planer. I don't know what the dimensions will come out. I'll just make them all even. Whenever I'm squaring up my lumber on the jointer, I always like to flatten out the cup side on the bottom first because I find it easier. And then once I've got that flat, I have a nice wide flat section to register against my fence to square up the bottom. If you do the other way, there's just not enough wood on the side to register against the fence to square up the bottom. After that, I will rip either on the band saw or the table saw to my width the width, desired width registering my straight edge and then I will thickness all this side and the top side to make sure everything's even. Okay we now have one square edge here and here and I've, I've made it to width on the bandsaw. I prefer using the bandsaw for longer boards and green boards where I don't know what movement it's going to do because a little movement on the table saw can be disastrous and quite frankly I'm a bit scared of the table saw. I don't like using it and I use it as little as possible. Now, I'm going to start thicknessing it, meaning I'm going to match 
this side with this side to make them parallel and the top with the bottom make them parallel. So I will have a four square side. Whenever I do this, I like to do the tops or the edges first because it is wider before I thickness it. And whenever I do this too, I also like to double them up because I have square edges, they will register against each other and it will be a lot safer that way. Make sure your grain is going in the right direction. And have at it. So while lunch is cooking, let's go ahead and go back to those legs. The first step is I needed to dimension them up. Remember, I only flattened up the interiors I glued together. And just like on the stretchers, that starts out of the jointer, where I flatten one edge so I can use it as a reference against the jointer's fence to create the adjacent side at a perfect 90 degrees. Finish to the bandsaw to get the dimensions I want and the thickness planer to get parallel sides so that we have a perfect four square. At which point I will usually dimension it to length at that time. Unfortunately, because I only have two legs and I need four, I needed to bisect them. And the easy way to do that one without a lot of math and measuring is I just go to the bandsaw and move the fence until I can get the saw blade into the same curve whenever I flip it along the horizontal axis. Then you get perfect bisected and we have two legs. From here, it's just back to the thickness planer to remove the bandsaw marks, and we are off to the races. So it's lunchtime. I'm getting to watch my YouTube videos. We've got all the milling done. We've got the legs glued up. Uh, already a start joinery and I walked around the shop and guess what? I don't have any screws or at least none that's long enough to work here. But I did find some dowels in my uh, dumpster bin. So design change. I decided I would use finger joints in this build. And since I don't like them very mechanical looking, I decided to do a two to one ratio where the outside uh, pins, I guess, would be half the size of the interior pin, I guess, the, the both pins. And I used my marking gauge to mark off a quarter of an inch. That way, having it proud, I wouldn't have to worry about getting things dead on perfect. Since in the past, I've already done a video on how to make green and green finger joints using hand tools, for something different, I decided to try it all with power tools. And I'm going to use my dreaded table saw to do this. The first thing I did was I pulled out my miter sled. Then I set up the fence. Now, when you are doing cross cuts and stuff like that, it's very dangerous to have uh, the wood riding against the fence because something could get pinched and bad things happen. So I put up a little waste block that will keep the edge off of the fence once the blade starts cutting. Then it has mattered just aligning everything so that the blade cut at the bottom of that baseline. I took with it a reference directly off of the board in that quarter inch from my marking gauge. Then it's just a matter of flipping and repeating until you get the shoulder cut for that single finger joint on all four of the rails in the project. cut the cheeks I'm going to use my bandsaw and while it's not critical to get that bottom corner dead on perfect it is nice and good practice because you'll need to do that in the next step now to lay out the mating points on these other tails I don't know what's fingers and tails when you're talking on finger joints on like dovetails before I change the setting on my marking gauge, I once again used it to lay out a quarter inch from the end and then just used a pencil, taking measurements directly off the piece. I have no clue how thick these pieces are. Then I could use that marking gauge to set the depth of each one of the sides. And because we did it on a machine, they should be fairly simple. And then it's just a matter of marking out the edges. 
Now here's the thing, we need to move the fence of our bandsaw exactly one saw kerf over. And the easiest way to do that is to use that line. But here's a question. Do you leave the line, do you take the line, or do you bisect the line? I'll give you a hint. You drew the line on the part of the wood that you need to keep. Answer? Yeah, you want to keep the line. Take every single piece of wood away right up next to that line, but that line needs to still be there. And even if you're using a knife to make a very thin line, you still got to use it. I then once again return to my marking gauge, set the depth for what I want it to be, and I use the blade to make a recess so that my chisel can drop into it. But to get rid of all that waste, I return to the bandsaw. And if you connect one corner, it'll give you a nice big gap that you can slide, and if you slightly touch the back of the bandsaw blade, you can get way far deep in to remove the waste. Flip it over again, do it again. I know people that do this four times, and they can actually bandsaw directly onto the baseline, and they do this when they have big joints. But me, it's still rough, so I like to go back to my chisel. And that's why I use that marking gauge to make the line. Because my chisel will just drop right down into that little kerf. Just go halfway from each side. That way you don't blast out, blast out the back end or mark up your workbench. And you're all set. Nice square baseline for the other part to fit into. Now it's time to return to the legs and make the joinery on there. Now the top section is going to be really easy because basically it's half a lav joint. The thing is we only need to take the width of the rails and transfer it to the top of the legs. And we're going to cut it out much like we did the finger joints with tenon shoulders and cross cuts. Setting the depth of the saw cut blade to roughly half the height of one of the rails. Now the key trick here is to make sure you cut them in the right spot. So I like to lay out all my legs as they will be on the table and mark off the spots that I will be cutting off. Because each leg is going to be different. So having that physical pencil reference is just a way for me not to screw up. Then it's just a matter of cross cutting the parts that you need for the shoulders. And each leg is going to have two of those shoulders so that the corresponding rails can both sit on that same leg. Then just cut off the tenon. This is the part where you have to make sure you get exactly in that corner because it's going to make a difference so that it matches up with the center rail which you're going to have to do completely with the table saw. And that table, that depth is set by the table saw's height. So now Back to the set table saw to cut out the middle section. So I just mark down six inches. Why six inches? Because it's a number. Then do, I'm cutting now the top section that the rail is going to fit into. Once again, two cuts. This time I don't need to do the pencil marks because I have the cuts on the top of the leg to tell me where to cut. From here I go back to my workbench and because I don't like doing math, I don't like doing measurements, I'm going to take them directly off of the piece. Because I have that saw kerf, the edge of the rail will kind of snug up into it when I cock it over, then I can just lay it down. And I like to do this twice just to make sure I'm getting it in the right spot. And now I have a perfect measurement, but notice the pencil, you can see it, which means the pencil mark has to stay. So set the table saw fence so that the tooth is right next to that. Then move your fence over so it references, so you have a perfect distance on every single board. And then just cut them out. Easy peasy. And honestly, if you're a little bit loose, that'll be okay, because they will still sit on the base, uh, and gravity will still flow through the leg. Because I've, I'm using the table saw, I'm just going to nibble my way down. I know there are a lot of woodworkers out there that have special dado fences. I do this operation so little that just using that thin thin table saw blade works just fine. I think I timed myself and it took me about two minutes to do each one of these legs getting rid of all that center section. 
Then cross your fingers and hope it fits. And because I'm me, I just couldn't leave those protruding fingers square. You're going to have to knock off the edges anyway so that they don't splinter in normal wear and tear. So you might as well round them off to give it a nice so soft feel and then look like a cool little shadow line. And since this is just a shop project, felt sander will be just fine. Is it perfectly smooth? No, but who really cares? Can't get the interiors with the belt sander though. So let's start a little assembly. If you can't tell, we've got some finger joints going on and I'm going to be doing a top and bottom square frame that's going to fit into these cutouts on the legs. Now to, since I'm lacking some screws and uh, don't have much glue, I cut all these pegs and I'm going to be pegging these joints. So, so when these finger joints go together like that, I'm going to drop a peg in right there so there's no way mechanically it can come apart. Uh, once it goes together, it goes together. And then whenever I drop the frames onto the legs, you're also going to see me peg them. Except this time I'm going to peg them at dovetails so that they can't come out uh, once they are driven in. And those two go will go together kind of like Lincoln Logs, I guess. Uh, now, before I actually do all that uh, little bit of gluing and pegging, uh, I want to figure out which parts I want to round over. For example, if this is, this is going to be the top frail, I don't want to round over the top because it's going to have the ledge in it and I don't want that round over right there, but I do want to round over the bottom of each one of these. And this is one of those times that where you get a, you acquire a tool over the years that you just start, be, becomes indispensable to you. I acquired this little plane. It's just a round over plane. I want to say I got it from Lee Valley, but I'm not 100% sure. It's a Taiwanese plane. I want to say it's 20 bucks. I re-hardened the blade and re-sharpened it, but it has become indispensable. I break edges all the time with this, getting a nice little round over. So I want to round over this. I look at my grain direction. I just grab hold of it. Give it a few strokes, and I have a nice round over, no routing, no nothing. It's got a nice edge to it. Just wonderful. Pick up something like this if you have a chance. I mean, this is a good holiday gift idea, and I want to say they're like 20 bucks, but I use this all the time. So let's get assembly. Notice that as I put what little glue I have, I don't put it over the entire finger, just towards the base. Remember, a portion of it, a quarter inch of it, is going to protrude, and you don't want glue on that. Also, before I drive the pegs, I like to clamp it to a square just to make sure it will be square when you go in. Because once that peg goes in, that thing ain't moving. And if you do two of the corners with the square in, the rest of it's going to be just fine because they're all the same size so you only have to clamp to that square once or twice for each entire frame it works out pretty well that way just drive the peg through locks it all together grab your flush cutting saw cut it off no sanding required no finishing you're pretty much done with this section right here and now easy peasy Well, it's not entirely important that you glue every single part with it when you're using pegs like this. If you got it, you might as well use it. And I had a little bit left scraped from the bottom of the uh, glue bottle after I mixed a little water in there. Uh, then it's just a matter of clamping it all together, dr drilling holes for the pegs. Notice how I start going straight in and then I lift it up. That's because I'm using a brad point bit, and because of the nature of the brad point with that center bit, if you start at an angle, sometimes the outside corners will hit before the brad has any chance to get into the wood and it'll skip off. So if you're doing anything with an angle, at least start out going straight and then rotate it to the angle you want. 
After that, it's just a matter of applying glue, sliding the top on, and then drilling and pegging it just like you did the bottom section, and you will have pretty much a finished frame. You don't have to leave the clamps on very long, just long enough to get the pegs in. When putting screws into end grain, most times I like to put a little bit of thick CA glue down the hole. It kind of strengthens it up, especially in stuff like this pine because the early growth is just so weak compared to the late growth. A little bit of CA, thick CA glue just kind of stiffens everything up. So it's about seven o'clock. Uh, we've got the frame done. It fits the X carve. I just don't have a top for it yet. I looked around my shop. I mean, my rules were anything in my shop. I found this piece of half inch yucky big box store plywood, and this will make a temporary top. I'm gonna to cut it in half and put the tack nail it on either side so I can remove it later, but that table will be useful in about 20 minutes. Woo! One day, one board, one table, and whatever else I found in the shop. Well, there you go. It's 8.30, so we've spent a little under 12 hours on this. We didn't work too hard. I mean, we paced ourselves. We took our time. We tried to think three or four steps ahead to reduce our number of work, number of processes we did. Uh, and we ended up batching out one whole workbench out of one board in one day. A fun little challenge. Now, if you'd like to see more challenges like this for me, give me some ideas in the comments below. Uh, and if you'd like to maybe help us support, buy something a little bit nicer than 2x12s, YouTube has a little blue button on our channel where you can throw us a few shekels, or you can visit our website, worththeeffort.com, under the support page. There's other stuff you can do to help us out. I hope you enjoyed this. There's nothing overly complicated about there, and there's nothing that I did with power tools, other than maybe thicknessing, uh, that you couldn't have easily done with hand tools. And honestly, because it's a shop appliance, if I didn't have a thickness planner, I would just use the wood as is. I mean, it's not that big a deal. It would probably look exactly the same. It's just a little bit thinner right now. You could do something like this without much effort. Just think it through. I hope you enjoyed following along, and I want you to remember one last thing. It is always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.